peace and the joy of the Lord is here this morning. Just something sweet, something precious. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. So uh, I'm just going to quickly and briefly, Manfred, you sit at the front. You want to hear. Is, difficult? is the sound okay? Or maybe you just want to pay attention to the sermon. It's good to have you here. I'm sure you're going to keep me accountable. Amen. So uh, I'm going to just briefly recap on a scripture or two that I used last week as well. Last week I spoke a little bit about some of the final things. And uh, yeah, the Lord is always, there's a word in every season. Um, the Lord is always preparing us for things to come. And uh, he said we shouldn't be alarmed because he's warning us before the time. And I'm just going to briefly recap on Matthew 24. Maybe you were here last week. So uh, then you will hear the same scripture again. But nothing wrong with that. If you haven't been here last week, maybe then you will hear it for the, for the first time in the context of the message. Also read from Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. So I uh, just want to briefly... Um, yeah, we live in the time between Jesus' first coming and the second time, uh, second coming. And how long that will exactly be, no one can tell you. No one will ever be able to give you that answer just because Jesus said no one know, will know. Only the Father will know. But all, but there's always a prof prophetic word for every generation that we should be ready. It's not just in the 90s or the 1800s or 1500s or right here where we are now. It's every season, Jesus said, be ready, okay? And I almost prayed it wrong in a sense that we, we should be ready for ourselves. But yes, we can work and pray. That's why we need to preach the gospel to, that everyone should be ready because that's the heart of the Father, okay? So uh, Jesus spoke about many things and the disciples asked Jesus about the signs of the end of the age and I think it's something that we cannot fully understand from where we are, but it's something that's important. That's why scripture refers to it often, okay? So uh, I want to read to you, and as I said, how do we, I'm not specifically preaching, no, I'm not preaching at all this morning about specifically Jesus coming back, or the rapture, or the trumpets, or the seals, or the antichrist. There's a lot to cover in the book of Revelation. There's a, a lot of things that will happen before Jesus come back. And we know in, throughout church history, and especially right now, you know, when we talk about the things like the rapture, uh, or that, that Greek word parousia, if I pronounce it correctly, um, not the whole church is not on the same page. There's dif different schools of thought in, in terms of the millennial will, view, etc. When, what will happen in terms of the great tribulation. Do your own studies, read regarding those things, pray regarding those things. But I said last week, I believe it's important that we stand on solid ground when we look at the things to come. Okay, because it will happen. It's part of God's word. And that's central. The second coming of Christ is one of the things that should really make the church excited. It's something that should really give us a lot of hope. Okay, the return of Jesus. I've sometimes tried to imagine what it will be like. And it's very difficult or impossible to understand exactly how these things will be. But scripture the word of God gives us a lot of clues. It also gives us a lot of advice or warnings, how to live our lives, how to be wise, and how not to be foolish. Um, there's a lot of warning that Jesus gives us. There's times where Jesus says, but he's the great shepherd, and like Psalm 23, come and sit with me at the, at the green pasture, pastures and just fill your tank, in a sense. But there's times and moments when Jesus says, be awake, be watchful, be ready, be alert, okay? And we can never be complacent, that will be wrong. And I will share a parable on that, that Jesus gave to his church. So uh, just briefly, I'm just going to repeat Matthew 24, uh, because it just lays so much foundation in terms of the things to come, and maybe the lenses to look through uh, in term, as we view the final things. Matthew chapter 23 Oh, apologies, Matthew 20, chapter 24, verse 3 to 12. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, 
when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, I just want to stop there briefly. I don't know about you, but sometimes I thought like, Jesus, just give us a little bit more. You, you, you tell us certain things, but give us more. Give us more exact stuff, okay? So, uh, but Jesus tells us a few important things. And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. See that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Now I think since Jesus spoke these words, there must have been many, many, many days, years, that many generations, believers or even unbelievers, thought this must be it. First, uh, First World War, Second World War, there's been countless massive wars, famines, etc. the past 2,000 years. So currently we might think, oh, we, how close are we? And I think forever people have been trying to, to puzzle these things out. Um, but Jesus said clearly, no one shall know, know the day or the hour. But there's advice, there's warning that Jesus gives to his church. I will just make four points. Um, I preached on this scripture last year and I mentioned it last week. Just four main things that I believe we should take to heart. You know, now very often all of us that has raised children or are busy raising children or the grandparents or the parents in the house will know that children and young ones don't always take heed. There's always on our national roads, there's boards that say drive 60 or 80 or 90 or 120. And so often, you know, we drive, I, when I drove to Vinduk, I see there's a guy, uh, he, he didn't listen to the warning. Okay, he, drove, he drove too fast and now he's going to have to pay a speed ticket. How often, you know, my kids, I'm not perfect and my kids aren't perfect. Where are they? They're, I love them a lot, but they're not perfect. How often we give a warning about a hot plate or something, don't jump off here or don't do that. And I see a few mums go like this and, you know, but nevertheless, those things happen. But there's something, there's something different when we talk about the word of God and about eternity and not having a second chance. There was a time in my life before I got to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, where I also thought as a teenager and a young person that, you know, if I kind of feel, get a feeling Jesus is coming soon, I will just repent about everything and just make sure my salvation is okay and hopefully I will make it to heaven. And that's probably the a thing that more people than, as, than myself thought about in life, but it's probably the most foolish thing to do in, in terms of eternity. You know, Jesus gave a warning here for the church, for believers. See that no one deceives you. See that no one leaves you, um, led you astray. Jesus says, point number two, do not be alarmed. Now, you know, sometimes when there's, when the children don't listen and there's blood or there's pain, we usually try to, okay, okay, you're going to be okay. It's okay. Deep, uh, breathe um, deeply. Um, I remember, I think a few years ago, our, our kids, uh, there's a, a Tommy Collard, where's Chris? He's not here this morning, but I see his family. He does the living desert tours, or he used to do that. And uh, one year he took our kids, uh, the young boys, on a, on, for their birthday on a, um, almost said a game drive. Let's call it a nature drive, a desert drive. And uh, he had a scorpion, and uh, he showed the young boys about the scorpion and gave them a, a lecture on, on wildlife and animals and poison scorpions. And, you know, he said to them, hold out your hand. And he holds the scorpion in his hand, but he's got the, 
um, the sting, the angle, you know, that very dangerous thing. And, you know, I remember my one son held, held out, out his hand and Tommy placed the scorpion on him. And he said to him, breathe. How awesome. <laughs> you know, not all of us do stuff like that, you know. But here Jesus is saying, you know, don't be led astray. Don't be alarmed. Now, it can only be if you are really rooted in the Lord, if your eyes are fixed on the Lord, if you really walk in a daily devotional relationship with Jesus, that when the wars and the famines and the earthquakes just keep on increasing, that we will keep our cool in a sense. Otherwise, many will be led astray because that's what scriptures say. So it's so important that our focus are not completely on all the things happening in this world. Yes, pay attention because Jesus gives us clues. But we, our hearts should be, our focus should be on our, him continuously, okay? Otherwise, we're going to be very alarmed, okay? I'm not sure what next month will be like. We all keep an eye on the fertilizers and the food shortages and energy crisis and all the stuff that can possibly happen. And many of those things have happened before, okay? Wars aren't something new. They happened 2,000 years, 3,000 years ago as well. Then Jesus, the third point that he says or makes, watch out that false prophets don't lead you astray, okay? So we know there will be false prophets. In verse 24, Jesus says, for false Christ and false prophets will arise, they will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, okay? So you with strong faith, you who's walking with the Lord, you whose house is built, on the solid rock, be careful that you are not being led astray. Because here it says they will perform great signs, even if possible, to deceive the elect. Okay? No one can say, I cannot say this morning, I will never be deceived, I will never be led astray. Okay? Be careful. This is a warning that Jesus gives to us. And he says that these things must take place. Okay? Somewhere between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus, these things will increase, these things will happen. We see many of the signs. There's a lot of um, data these days about earthquakes the past hundred years, now they are increasing, um, etc. We just need to be ready. We just need to be ready, and ready mean obeying the Lord, loving the Lord, obeying what He commanded us to do, not to be sidetracked or deceived will be led astray if there's, I mean, it's terrible, you know, you should test what I'm saying here in the pulpit, because it's sad that from time to time, you see in one of our newspapers, there was a pastor or someone, um, and it's on the front page of a newspaper, who said to old lady, the Lord is saying to me, give your house to me, I want no one's house, please, um, the Lord is good, I've got my own wife and my own kids and a place to stay, but that's deception, that's lies. Jesus did not own a house even. Neither did the apostles spend their time building um, physical stuff. Nothing wrong with that, okay? If you plant or sow or build or work, continue doing that, okay? But be, there's so many false uh, prophets around. It seems sometimes that if we kick a tree in this town, there's an apostle or a prophet that will fall from the tree. Okay, there should be apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists, but it seems they have increased amazingly in, in the last times or in the last days. Then the second point I made last week, Colossians chapter 1, and I believe it's just so foundational, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 to 16, Jesus says, or the word says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And I just said last week, it's amazing that of all the beautiful mountains and oceans and stars and galaxies that, that Paul could refer to, he says thrones or rulers or authorities or dominions, okay? Well, the one thing you just should know is God did not create them evil. He did not create them bad. They became evil. God created Adam and Eve good. 
but they sin, okay? We are all, we all battle with that issue of sin. So I just, in Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, Paul says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over, um, over them in him, okay? At the cross, at the resurrection, Jesus, the victory belongs to him. So even all the bad and all the evil, all the demons and all the work of the enemy, everything that happened, God is sovereign over that. God is in control over that. So even as we see lawlessness and all the things increasing, it does not mean God is absent. It does not mean God is not in control. It does not mean God did not create them, okay? He created them good, I believe, or the word says, okay? But they became evil. They disobeyed, okay? The word said that the enemy is the liar. Since from the beginning, he has been the liar, okay? So just know that everything bad, everything terrible, God is above that, okay? The victory belongs to him. He will come back and he will rule and he will reign. And here this morning, I wanna continue from Matthew, book of Matthew, gospel according to Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, verse one to 13. And as I said, this refers to the time between this first coming of Jesus Christ and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Last week, I used um, uh, um, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, 16, and 17, we know that all scripture is for our good. It's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction, okay? So when we read scripture, we need to know every portion of scripture, I believe, is God breathed, breathed. okay? But here's the thing, there's a message in every chapter. There's a message, there's something that God wants to see us. And here in this parable that Jesus gave to the disciples and what he gives to us, there's a very urgent message. There's a massive warning for us not to be foolish, but to be wise. Let's read it and let's see what the word of God teaches us right now. Matthew chapter 25 Verse 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. That's not the pot, that's a word for some of us this morning, okay? Early morning when it was cold, I know about one or two people who already said it was difficult to wake up. Sleeping is fine. All 10, you will see, actually became drowsy and slept. Nothing wrong with that. But at midnight, there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those um, young ladies rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the, the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while, and while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the, the other young ladies or bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. And then verse 13, watch therefore, for you, not, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Jesus is giving, he's speaking from his heart. He's speaking from what he knows. He is the word. He is eternal. He's part of the Trinity. He knows how things have started. He created everything. Everything was created in him and for him. And he knows exactly when he will come back. The Father will obviously show him. Okay, Jesus knows about the end. He knows about wars. He knows about earthquakes. He knows about deception. He knows about um, everything that will happen. And in that context of viewing the things of the, or the final things, the things to come, he says in Matthew 24, be awake, be alert, see that no one deceives you. And he, here he gives a parable to all of us to take to heart. 
Now, it's important that every one of us pay attention, but as I work through the scripture, it just moves my heart, and this where, that's where I will end later this morning. It just moves my heart again for the harvest to come in. For those people I know, those people I love in this town, in this nation, in other parts of the world that's not serving Christ, that has not responded to the gospel call yet, those to whom the door will be shut forever. That's what the, the word teaches us. So there's something at the core of this message that relates to preaching the gospel, praying for the nations, praying for the harvest to come in. It's not just, yes, it's about me and my, because I will stand as a person before God, but there's also something about not just making sure I'm okay, but my family, my extended family, the people we work for, the people in this town, in this nation, okay? Because there will be wise and there will be the foolish. Scripture teaches that in many places. Okay, so let's have a look. As I said, it's about Jesus. Some, it's about being ready there between the first coming and the second coming. Scripture says that Jesus will return, okay? And just the fact that it took a lot of time in terms of our minds, okay? We will read just now from, from Peter that that should not fool us in any way. In the first verse, Matthew 25, verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven, now the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience, so he was a bit more sensitive to, to use the word God and to write it out. So he's speaking about the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is exactly the same thing. He says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like the ten virgins, or the bridesmaids, or the young women, different translations use different, wor different words, who took their lamps, lamps, um, um, sorry, took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom, okay? So it's about the kingdom and it's about the bridegroom. It's about the time between the first and the second coming, okay? And it's about every one of us here this morning, okay? It's about everyone who's not against Christ, but everyone who professed to be part of the church. We will just now see who was really the believers and who was not, okay? So the parable is still about how the bride of Christ should prepare to meet him, okay? So what should we do as we wait for the second coming of Christ? It might be in a week or a month or 10 years or a hundred or a thousand um, and there's, there is signs and there's prophetic um, ways that the word help us to understand when it might be more or less or what had to happen, okay? But it's the f most foolish thing to try and say uh, when exactly that might be. The message is how do we need to be ready, okay? That we should be ready. How do we prepare? Verse 2 to 4, five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. Um, five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. So the word says they were foolish because they did not take oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with them. Now scripture interprets scripture. We will just now understand what's the meaning of what Jesus is teaching here. I just want to read to you from Matthew chapter 7. Now remember, it's Matthew, he's an author, okay? Matthew is a person, the gospel according to Matthew. So Matthew is writing the whole gospel according to Matthew as we, as we know it. And here he, he tells us this parable or about, he writes about it, that Jesus told the disciples about, and he sp speaks about the foolish and the wise. But a few chapter, quite a few chapters earlier on in Matthew 7, Matthew also gave us something that Jesus taught these people about being foolish and about being wise. So let's look in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. What did Jesus say? Who's foolish and who is wise? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And anyone who listens to my teachings and follow it is wise. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. So there's an opportunity for each and every one of us 
to be wise this morning. There's an opportunity to become wiser, to listen more, to read it more, to study it more, to pay attention. Just coming to church doesn't mean there will be oil in your lamp. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follow it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain came in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat and the wind beat the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and does not obey it is foolish. The word is so clear. It is so simple. Jesus gives us a simple picture that helps us to understand who he considers, not the world or anyone, not myself, who he says, who is wise and who is foolish. But anyone who hears my teaching and does not obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods came and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus said it will come down. It will not stand. When Jesus had, his, um, when Jesus had finished um, saying these words, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. So there, once again, Jesus says, who will be wise and who will be foolish? The wise will be the people who listen and obey his teachings, his words. Later on, Quite a few chapters later on, Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 24, there's a lot about warning, not being deceived, not being deceived about wonderful signs and magic and all that nonsense that's around. And he says, Jesus gives us in Matthew 25, he gives us a parable that further illustrates this point about being ready and about being wise and how to prepare. And he talks about the bridesmaids or the young ladies all of them had lamps, okay? Now, what's a lamp? It's, a, it's something that makes light. It's something to shine because they were waiting for the bridegroom, okay? So, the bride is not mentioned in this parable, but the bridesmaids, bridesmaids or the, the young ladies or the ten virgins are mentioned. So, let's continue and let's see what, what the... Um, what Jesus says, what should be wise. Okay, so they had a job appointed. Um, they had to sh shine their lights. What is their job? What is their calling? They need to be ready. It's all about, in this parable, it's about the lamps that need oil, that need to be ready, waiting for the bridegroom to come. Okay? And then it says, um, so they were appointed to shine. They need to shine that light when he comes back. Okay? And I think, in the past two years, I've spoken a few times about drift, and especially uh, 2002, this time, no church, no school. Oh, it was really challenging, and, and how it seemed that some of us drifted, in a sense. Praise the Lord, we can be a full house, in a sense, but uh, we all know, two years ago, or well, last year, this time, I think we were probably one of the last church services on 50, and then I think at the end of May, we went to 10 people, and we had Zoom church. I really hope that it will not happen soon again, but it might. We will have to wait and see. But here, yeah, back to the parable. But five of them did not take seriously their calling to give light, and they neglected the only means by which they could do it and to do what they were called. They took no oil, okay? Now, we will just see a little bit later um, what that refers to. They only had the lamps. The lamps was to provide light, and we all know that a, la a lamp or a torch in our um, context, maybe a torch without batteries is useless. A lamp without oil is useless. You cannot use it. It will not be able to shine that light. But they did not have a passion to use the necessary means to fulfill their point of their pos position. Their foolishness was to think that the mere form of a religious lamp would be sufficient. Okay? Their foolishness. They made a terrible mistake, okay? It doesn't say they were there planting or plowing, uh, plowing. They were there for something specifically. They were the bridesmaids. They were uh, to, to, to receive, in a sense, the, the bridegroom, and they had to shine their lights. They needed batteries for the torches. They needed oil 
for their lamps, but they were foolish. There was, there was something where they seemed to be okay. I mean, they had the lamp. Now think about the same parallel. It might be coming to church, okay? Coming to church and having a lamp. I'll get to that just now, okay? Maybe, and, and, and the biggest error they made was as explained in the parable, that right at the end, they might quickly borrow oil from someone else to put into their lamp and to be ready for the lamp to shine, okay? And that did not work. In verse 5, the teaching says, and Jesus says, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept, okay? So, the bridegroom in the parable was delayed. I will not say Jesus is delayed, but Jesus is choosing the time, or God knows the time that he needs to come back, and that will be the time when he comes back, okay? But in the parable, he was delayed. In our context, we can say since Jesus' earthly ministry, since the word became flesh, okay, 2,000 plus years ago to, to right now, there's a lot of time, a lot of years, decades, century that went by. And often people question, but where is God in all this misery? And where is God? God is, everything is playing out exactly. Just remember, um, when the final things happen, whether it will be in our generation or not, it will be the most awesome. When, if we were to see the, now there, the whole rapture and all of that coming, and I'm not going to get into that argument right now, but whether we are here or not, and we see something like the Antichrist, we should know. It was prophesied 2,000 years ago. How amazing that the word and scripture are fulfilled. Okay, so he, the bridegroom was delayed. Yes, Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and we know he will come back. And if it might feel that it's taking a long time, and that might give a false sense of there's a lot of time for me to fill my lamp whenever I need to. But listen to the warning Jesus gives us. Then they all became drowsy and they slept. Now, I just want to go quickly to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 9. And, and I believe it ties in what Matthew writes here and the warning that Peter gave us here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 9. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will, they will say what happened to the promise that Jesus Christ is coming again. They will say what happened to the promise that Jesus Christ is coming again. From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the word since the world was first created. Have you ever heard that before? Okay? That people will mock it and like, ugh, whatever, you know? That's the same, in the same way that people mocked Noah before the flood. And the flood came. Okay? And right now, there's many that mock the church or mock the death of Jesus Christ or the resurrection or that Jesus ascended um, that, he that he was resurrected on the third day, that he rose, and that he will come back. Here Peter says it, okay? What happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From the beginning of time of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. That's a lie. Not everything remained the same. A lot changed prophetically, okay? If we look at since the flood and, and Jesus and the church, and everything, not, it didn't remain the same, and it will not remain the same. The word teach us that Jesus will come back. They deliberately forget, um, they've deliberately forgot that God made the heavens by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out of the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are, they are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't being 
um, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people might think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. Now that justifies a sermon probably on its own. The Lord is slow to anger and is graciously giving the, the world, humanity, and the church, the church time to be ready, to be, to, be, be, to be prepared, and for us as the church to preach the gospel, to share the good news, to warn about judgment, to warn that Jesus will come, be, be, will, that Jesus will return, that there will be a second coming, okay? And as in Matthew chapter 7, the word distinguished between the foolish and the wise, those who obey and build on solid bedrock, and those who are foolish and who build a house on the sand, that when the wars and the rumors of the wars and the everything come, it will be washed away. And here Jesus gives a warning and he says, but he will be delayed. And Peter says, yes, but one year, one, he said one day will be like a thousand and a thousand like one day. Yes, it will take time, but don't let that fool you. He will return. Amen. It's important that we preach it and that we teach it and that we proclaim it and that we say it. This has been a stumbling block for the for 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 well for the world and the church in a sense for two thousand years because Jesus hasn't returned in my forty two years, so maybe there's ten more years for me to sort out my life. But this is not what it teaches. There's a there's a there's a warning to be wise. And here's the thing I cannot be wise for you. I cannot be saved for you. I cannot obey for you. I can preach the gospel. I can pray, okay, etc. And everything else that we are commanded to do. But I need to be wise for myself. Amen. Okay. Then let's continue. Um, yeah, in Matthew 25, verse 5, Jesus said he will be delayed. There's a, a, and secondly, we can just notice that all 10 of those young ladies... Um, that they all fall asleep, all 10 of them, um, and the word does not condemn it, okay? So there's natural rhythms in life. We work, we sleep, etc. So there's nothing, um, don't read something in it that uh, it's, the, it's just referring to the normal activities, or most commentaries says that it refers to the normal day-to-day -day things. Some of us are teachers or engineers or accountants or mums or whatever we need to be, work, continue, nowhere in the scripture or nowhere in this parable, Jesus says, go to the mountains and wait for me. Go to the desert and just wait for me there. Peek out the window and wait for me. Continue with your work. Continue what you are called to do. Continue with raising your kids. Continue. Don't ever fall for that thing about selling everything and you know, sometimes people have made terrible bad decisions based on fear. Jesus says, all of them slept, but five had oil and five did not have oil. We'll get to that. Okay, even in Matthew chapter 24, verse 45, the word says, Blessed is the servant whom the master finds doing his work when he comes. Okay, continue what you are doing. If you're writing, continue writing. If you can... Whatever your job is, continue with that. But here we see in verse 6, But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Now in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, we read the similar type of language. And it says there in 1 Thessalonians, I don't think it will be up there. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. So you see, there's a bit of a parallel here in Matthew 25, verse 6. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom, okay? Come out and meet him. That Christ will go out. The people need to be ready. Um, and that's going to happen someday. That's going to be terrible for some people, and it's going to be awesome for others. Amen? That's what Scripture teaches us. Because the foolish, as we will see just now, will be in great trouble. And we should, our hearts should break for that. 
hearts should break for that. Um, in Matthew chapter 25, verse uh, 7 to 9, it says, Then all those young ladies rose and trimmed their lamps. They prepared their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. It's like the torch. Where's the battery? There's no battery. Trying to trim the lamp, prepare the lamp. But the lamp, there's no oil. A lamp cannot work without oil. A battery cannot work, a torch cannot work without a battery. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you. I'm going to repeat that. Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for them for yourselves. Okay, so this is not um, teaching about being selfish or anything. Okay, I cannot be saved for you. You cannot obey on my behalf. I need to follow Jesus myself. You need to obey and follow Jesus for yourself. The wise said to the foolish, there you go. Go to the shop and fix your own problem. Jesus is giving a massive um, He's opening up something for all of his people to be wise, okay, in this context. Um, there's, there's probably this thing about, I was one of them, definitely. I went to church for the first 22 years in my life without really knowing Jesus. Not being born again, not being baptized, not being spirit-filled, and living, trying to obey a little bit here and there, but living a life in the flesh as well. I probably were one of, I was definitely one of those who had a little lamp, who had a little torch. And I sometimes wanted to show people, see, I go to church, I've got a lamp, I've got a torch. But if Jesus were to come back, there would be no oil in my lamp. He wouldn't shine. We, we, we learned that little song when we were children. Yes, you look his kind for Jesus. Let your lamp, lamp shine. Amen. This is where it comes from. Okay. So they have neglected the means appointed for them to do their duty. And not even the shouts awaken them to their empty lamps. Not at first anyway. They, trim to, they try to trim their empty lamps, but it's useless. There was no oil in it. Okay. And then they said to the wise, give us some of your oil. And they said, it will not be enough for ourselves and for you. The fact that we see that the five wise young ladies won't give to them any oil, it's not about selfishness, as I said. It's meant to teach the impossibility of borrowing someone else's faith. Okay? If Jesus right now had to walk in here or to descend and come back, okay? If you walk to the person that you think is the... That's a very dangerous term I'm going to use right now, but let's call it the biggest child of God, the most, the person that obeys the Lord the most, and you were to walk to that person and say, give me a bit of your oil, give me a bit of your faith, give me a bit of your obedience. Then that person, according to this uh, parable that the, Jesus teaches us, will say, I cannot. I pay the price. I took up my cross. I denied myself, and I followed Jesus, I heard his voice. I obeyed his commandments. Go and find, sort yourself. I cannot, in this context, help you in any sense. And that, that needs to break our hearts for our bigger families, the bigger community, for whoever we know who's not walking in the fullness of following Jesus, of being justified and righteous, etc. Okay? It's meant to teach the impossibility of borrowing faith. I have said, told that story before. My, my wife will not mind if I do it. But uh, when she was, before she was a born again Christian, she was also a hairdresser. And this one older lady once came to her and said to her, but young girl, are you, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? And she was like, mm, not quite, but my oma is and my, and my um is, okay? my uncle is. Now, that's exactly where we think, you know, we can 
give reference to this or to that, but that's exactly the, the message that, or the trap that we should avoid, thinking but doing a few good deeds or just repenting on 99.9 .9 before Jesus returns, everything will be okay, okay? It's warning us exactly not to do that. It's meant to teach the impossibility of borrowing the power of the Holy Spirit, the impossibility of borrowing obedience or faithfulness, okay? You need your own oil in your own lamp. You cannot give it to your children. You cannot give it to your parents. You cannot give it to your grandparents, and the grandparents cannot give it to the uh, grandchildren. We can pray for them. We can share with them. We can love them, okay? But according to the parable, there was the wise and there was the foolish. It will be too late, okay? When the, ten young, uh, the, when the wise young ladies, what did they mean in verse 9? There won't be enough for both of us, okay? We cannot have faith for us and for you. We cannot have inner spiritual life for ourselves and for you, not even for your spouse. We cannot give you obedience and the faithfulness used of God's appointed means, okay? That's the important thing. That's what the oil in this context refer to. It's your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, being a believer that's following the Lord, okay? That's where he said the goat, goats and the sheep will be divided, okay? He's not coming back for everyone. He's coming back for his bride, those who truly and sincerely love him and follow him. If you neglect this in this life, we, no one can help you. Each one needs to bear his own load. So in desperation, the foolish virgins who wasted their lives ran for the impossible, instant end time obedience, okay? Instant end time faith, trying at 99 to go to the dealer because they heard the cry. What's gonna happen next in verse 10 to 12? And while they were going to buy, because they saw, well, they heard the cry, they probably heard the trumpet, um, Jesus, will, we'll see when he's starting to come back. It's probably not going to happen in an instant, but that's debatable as well. What's happening here? They are running to fix the problem. They see they were foolish. They see they, they, made, they got it wrong. And here in verse 10 to 12, it says, and, they, and while they were going to buy the bridegroom, Jesus came. And those who were ready went in with him, in, um, to the marriage feast, those who had oil in their lamps, those who, heard, who knew his voice, those who were obeying, those who were following, those who were taking up the cross, those who knew Jesus, those who belonged to him, those who entered through the narrow gate, the whole word in a sense, okay? Those who were following, those who were wise, those whose houses was built on the solid rock, because they obey the teaching of Jesus Christ. It says, they went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. It was shut. The scripture says it was shut. There's nothing in this Bible that I know of that says after you died, there will be an extra opportunity to repent and to come to Christ. If it's gone, it's gone. There's something final. We've got this life and this life only to respond to the gospel call, to say yes to Jesus. So as we view the final things and the things to come, the, the message of this parable is have, la have oil in your lamps, okay? No, and, and, and when you read this part, the door was shut. Jesus means it was shut. It was done. He came back. That's the end. You cannot run and go buy oil at 99. I'm not exactly sure how everything will happen when Jesus comes back because that's something still to happen in future. But there's a very uh, sincere or not sincere, a very um, earnest message for all of us. Verse 11. Afterwards, the other virgins came also. They probably got their oil now saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But ye, not the church, not the pastor, not someone you're going to bribe or anything, but ye, but ye answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. 
Now that's words that none of us want to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not coming back as a baby in a manger, okay? He's not coming to be born from the Virgin Mary. He's coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and there will be judgment. And we need to say these things, that we can hear these things, that we can sp spread a gospel from a place of love, but there's also massive eternal consequences. I've spoken to someone in the past week. I cannot understand in my human nature, I will always try and give a second chance for someone, but when it's done, it's done. When it's finished, it's finished. Some will be doomed to hell forever, and some will be in the presence of God the Father forever. And I always think, if I try to think about it, and it's just me thinking, sharing my thoughts, like, but in you, when you are in hell and, and you think like, but, but God, I got it wrong, I want to repent, there's nothing in Scripture that teaches us there will be a bridge from hell to heaven. It's about here. It's about now. It's about oil in our lamps right now. Don't say yes to Jesus based on fear. It's God's goodness that will lead us, that leads us to repentance. But it's a, it's a message that we need to hear. There's a door that will be shut. And Jesus, Scripture teaches us, Jesus gave this parable for a reason. Jesus says the other virgins or the other young women will come saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Because why do they say it? They want to be part of the marriage feast. And he will answer, truly I say to you, I don't know you. And in a sense, we should just stop there and pray probably because it's massive. The, the consequences of this parable is eternal. But Jesus, being the shepherd, okay, he gives it to us with love, this warning. Everything from Matthew 24 to 25, he says, prepare yourself. Make sure there's oil in your lamp. These are terrifying words at the end of the age when Jesus come back. I never know you. You were part of the church. You were one of the ten virgins, not part of the world. You had lamps. You had religion. You had a form of it, but you took no care of what was on the inside. So it speak about our relationship. It speak. It's not about how much money you give. It's not about how often you attend small group or intercession or, or church or anything like that. Those are good things to do. And you will probably be, be led to do it the more you love the Lord and the more you want to obey Him. It's the same as preaching the gospel. Some have led thousands and, I don't know, the Reinhard Bonkers of the world, probably millions to Christ. And some of us may be a one or a two, but that's okay. Some of us got the calling of uh, a Paul or a Peter, and, and some of us did not get that, okay? But it's important in terms of what's on the inside, the oil, that we are in good standing, okay? That our let your little lamp shine, okay? It, just owning a lamp means nothing. The 10 young ladies all had lamps, but only five are called wise because they had oil inside the lamp. To care, um, we need to take care of what's on the inside to keep those lamps shining, okay? And then here in verse 13, um, <laughs> Jesus, if even I think enough has been said in a sense, but in verse 13, Jesus said, um, watch therefore for you neither, um, watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour. Different translation says, so be constantly vigilant or therefore be on alert. He's warning us. He's going to say one day, I said to you, he's using a little guy like myself to preach this word, just to read it to you, that we should hear it. Be ready. Don't be deceived. Don't, don't, be, um, don't be caught off guard. Don't be like the foolish. Be like the wise, okay? Watch. Watch does not mean, as I said, stand out the window looking if Jesus is returning. It doesn't say go to the ocean or go to a mountain or somewhere and wait there, okay, and wait for Jesus' return. Continue to sleep at night. Continue to work at day. Continue to do what you are called to do, but make sure there's oil in your lamp. 
Many will hear these words. I don't know you. Depart from me. Many will be deceived. Verse tw- uh, chapter 24 um, teaches us. So it's about being ready. It's about being awake. It's about being watchful. It's about being vigilant. Okay? It's not about staring out the window. It means about relationship with Jesus, about being spiritually alive and alert to Jesus and the Holy Spirit and what He calls us to do. It's about knowing Him. It's about simply following Him, knowing Him, loving Him, having oil in your lamp. You cannot at 99, even if you want to, okay? I cannot say if we, I cannot, if I know Jesus is returning tomorrow lunchtime, I cannot go to friends, family, people of this nation, and I cannot save them. I can say to them, please respond. Jesus is coming back tomorrow at 12. But I cannot do anything more than that. I can pray them, I can love for them, I can share the gospel, but I cannot fill their lamps. Okay, and that gives me, makes my heart beat far, faster because I know I need to pray for more because Jesus might come back soon. Okay? We always need to be ready. In 2 Peter chapter 3, G- Peter addresses this thing just because it's taking a lot of time. Don't think Jesus is not coming back. So it's about our relationship to follow Jesus. So Lord, we come to you this morning. Father, we come to you as your people, as your church. Father, and we say, Lord God, that, that Lord, we love you, Lord God. And Father, we don't just want to say it because it's the right thing to do, Lord. We don't even just come to church because it seems to have a form of religion and the right thing to do, Lord God. Father, I pray for myself, my family, Lord God. Father, I pray for every person in this house this morning, Lord God. Oh, Lord, that we will take every step possible, Lord God, to be wise and to build our houses, Lord Step possible, not to respond.